Shane Murphy here, entrepreneur and restaurant marketing expert. Welcome to the Restaurant Rocket Fuel podcast, where we discuss marketing strategies that leading restaurateurs are using to grow and expand their restaurants. This podcast is sponsored by Boostly, the text marketing company that works with every point of sale and online ordering vendor in the industry. No contracts, no monthly fees. Learn more at Boostly.com. Welcome back, everyone. We are thrilled to have Jerry Hancock with us today. Jerry and his wife are the founders of Sub-Zero Ice Cream, which has 27 units and probably the most interesting ice cream concept that I've ever experienced. Uh, They've had a lot of national attention across most news outlets and appeared years ago on Shark Tank as well. Jerry, thank you so much for coming on today to share a bit more about your story with us. Well, thank you. I'm honored to to be able to be interviewed or go through the podcast. Yeah, you bet. Maybe before we dive in too far, can you tell us more about your background and the story behind Sub Zero? You know, it's kind of interesting because I really think that everybody has a unique background. So everybody has unique experiences as they go through life. So I'm not any different than that. So it's uh so my to get through college, I was I had some mechanical experience. I worked on F-16s um, to help pay for college. And then I uh, took industrial design, which is product development. I uh, did a year of that. I also got a patent while I was doing that, and I was going to trade shows. But I was also taking chemistry, in, and I eventually ended up graduating in chemistry. I told my wife, I said, well, I think uh, buying a franchise might be a good way to learn how to run a business. So we... We bought a um, we bought a New York burrito franchise, which is kind of a wrap um, franchise. But we weren't doing as well as we needed to, so we ad- needed to add something. So the product development, you know, experience kicked in. Started asking people what they wanted, and that's where ice cream came into play. And I couldn't afford the freezers, and the ice cream manufacturers said, "Well." Um, if you're not in a not in a great location, they said don't add ice cream. They said it'll just it'll just be dollar in dollar out. I said people will just go right past you. It won't really help you. And so I did my research, checked on some places that had they just added ice cream as an afterthought, and that was true. The uh, ice cream as an afterthought is a as a bad idea. So that's where things started. Was like I had to figure out what something different, and so. They went back to the customer and said, what do you like about other people's product? And it all came down to customization. So the only thing I could think of to make it more custom, and this is about 2004, was um, I defined it as you had to start with the liquid because the only way to flavor an ice cream is to start with a, it, the only way to make it more custom is to, is to change the flavor. The only way to change the flavor in ice cream is, is start before it's a solid. So it came back to that chemistry of like states of matter and you know you have to start with the solid so it can dissolve through and that's where things started and then my li- my wife left an article out on liquid nitrogen and that's I was like well that's it you know we can make it in seconds and and then it was a lot of testing about four or five years of testing to get it really right and probably another five more to really get better systems so about 10 years really in the making before we really felt confident that we could expand that's that's fantastic and for those who haven't had experience with like sub-zero and the liquid nitrogen process you know i i first experienced this when i was going to school in uh, provo utah and went to a sub-zero location and it's unlike anything that you ever experience you you walk in and you at the start of the line, they're not scooping like ice cream out of a barrel. It's this liquid that goes through this process. And maybe can you describe what happens as you yeah. go down that line? You know, that's it's funny because we when we opened originally in that first test location with the New York burrito, I had somebody come in and they said, What are you gonna open up the ice cream shop? And I said, What do you mean? It's open. He says, Where's the freezers? And I was like, yeah. oh, you know, that's a missing concept of visually. So what we do is we start with the, you know, the, the definition of the product is, is custom made to order. So we start with the liquid. So you can pick between a premium ice cream, a low fat, a custard, a vegan, 
um, keto, Italian ice, a variety of different mixes, and then you you get to pick your flavors. Now our flavors are concentrated; they're made for us. They're you know specifically designed for this uh, process, and then we add the flavors so you can mix your flavors. So if you want a strawberry cheesecake. You can make strawberry cheesecake, but we don't have strawberry cheesecake. We have strawberry or cheesecake. But then if you do an and and add them together, then it becomes that new flavor. So you can create new flavors from our palate. And then uh, you add a mix in and then we freeze it. It takes about 15 seconds. We came up with a patented process that that um, creates a, a layering effect, really. Um, so it's... Um, and we patented that process of of those layers forming. Um, so anyway, that's and then we scoop it. it. Takes a and if it's too hard, then we can soften it. And then if it's too soft, then we can harden it. So you get it to the right texture. So it's there's we we're in a store in um, Massachusetts. One of our stores we opened this last year, and we had people, you know, science people. They were there and they're just kids, and they were just like just their minds were just going like, well, how many yeah. combinations is this? So they did the math just in there as a family. And they came back to me and they said, you know, you have three quadrillion flavor or options. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's about right. And, um, but it just kind of blew their mind. It's like, I have three quadrillion choices to make. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Cause there, there's nothing like that, that moment when as a consumer, like the first time experiencing Sub-Zero ice cream, you see it go from, from liquid and then like it's like this liquid nitrogen just turns that into a solid like instantly and boom, you have ice cream. Right. And it's like you see the whole creation process that in traditional ice cream you don't experience. And it, it's a really fun and unique um, concept to be able to have as, as a consumer. And I imagine that's, that, that is a different experience. You talked about how there's some education, like this isn't, yeah. it's not out of a barrel. There aren't freezers and there, there's a new concept. Yeah. People but, walk in off the street and they're tourists, you know, and they, and they, so they don't have any idea what they're expecting. Yeah. They walk in and they go, okay, I want uh, this flavor ice. Cream. Okay. And I, and then I start pouring out some liquid and they're like, what are you going to make me? And I'm like, well, just wait. And then I, and then you blast the nitrogen and you get this kind of, um, and then they just jump and it's like, and then they giggle, you know, and yeah. it's, that, it's that excitement. And it was like, okay, wow. And it's, and I, I think there's a, there's a factor of, well, you know, edutainment, you know, there's, yeah. a, cause a, a lot of the, there's several BYU and UVU, chemistry classes that actually offer extra credit to come into our store and, and um, write a paper on it. Oh, fascinating. So it's every year we get this crowd of like college kids that come through and, you know, write a report on, on uh, what, how it's happening or what's happening. It's really a really unique form of marketing is going through, through that university and those professors just, yeah, they're, they're marketing you through their right. the science class. Um, but yeah. you're getting exposure to all of those students along the way. You know, I, I imagine you, know, you guys have been doing this, you know, a, a very, a very long time now. Mm -hmm. um, and I imagine marketing has shifted through the years and there's been an, an awareness process that has happened with Sub-Zero. Um, maybe in the early days, what did marketing look like for the stores as you were starting out? And how did that shift and change as the years have gone by well you figure like we started 2005 it really <laughs> so i was pre-facebook um you know pre-social media really you know taking off so it's so we've had to adapt quite a bit over the years now when we started it was print so it was it was a lot of like mailers and things like that but we'd also but fairs were important to try and get the, you know, in, in-person events. And as time's gone, gone on, then that's been less important to move the needle and more important to make content. Um, 
which I think is good because we, I've often said, because we do STEM education as well. So we go into schools and pre present STEM, a STEM program. Okay. And then the last thing we do is we talk about ice cream. So I prefer doing that than, than anything, just because I really, I've kind of, I've always had a belief that a business had to have a bigger person than money. Yeah. And, um, so my purpose is STEM education. And, um, and so I've, I, I, I wouldn't say it's our front and focus to most people, but I, it's not uncommon for me to say that we're an education company first and we just happen to make really good ice cream. That's a fantastic concept. And it is, it is, you are in a very unique place with your brand to be able to do that where others just can't. It's actually a competitive advantage mm. that you have for marketing, which a lot of, sometimes if you look deep enough at like a restaurant brand or concept, when you find unique things about you or your brand, mm -hmm. if you can lean into that and use that, it gives you a, a marketing advantage that others just cannot compete on. A lot of people can compete on price or on discounts or on, you know, the just the, the everyday things. But if you can find that competitive advantage that makes you different or makes you unique, even if it's just part of your story, that makes a difference from a marketing perspective. And you've been able to capitalize on that through STEM and through education and you know, the the connection that you have with that. Um, now, I believe it was back in 2013, you also had the experience of going on ABC's you know Shark Tank right. show. Um, can you tell us about that experience of how that actually came to be and would love to hear about the impact that that either had or didn't have through the process. Um, well, we, we had, I mean, I, I've always liked the idea of going on Shark Tank, but I love that show. We were on season four, so it was fairly early you yeah. know, in the cycle that we're in now with, with uh, Shark Tank. Um, but there still was 40,000 applicants that season. And so I, I just knew we were going to get on because I knew we, we made a good process or a good show. And when it comes to going on a show like that, it's more, more important that even though the sharks will look at, you know, the business itself, the, um, the, that's who, not who picks, who gets on the show. The producers pick who get on the show. So you've got to be yeah. good. You've got to be good TV. If you're not good yeah. TV, you're not going to get on the show. Um, so you got to pick your audience. And with that process, it you have to kind of shift because you shift from the the producers to the sharks. And so you're um so being able to shift your pitch is is uh is interesting. But even though when, when you're in there, like we really felt like we had Barbara, we would have gotten a deal, but we had Lori at the time they were switching off. Sure. And um, so we always felt like that was we. So when we when we heard what our panel was and it's really the day of, um, then it's like, all right. Number one goal, get on TV, because it doesn't mean you if you, you film, you're going to get on TV. Yeah. So be good TV. In other words, likable. And so we focused on being likable so we get on TV rather than focusing on making sure we had a deal. Um, but, um, and when it comes down to it, you can't, even if the shark doesn't understand your business, like I would say that most of the sharks don't understand franchising. Barbara's the only one that understands franchise business, in my opinion. Um, and I'm not trying to be condescending to the rest. I'm just yeah. saying... She just is the only one that understands it. It's there's a it's a very unique business model. Yeah. And um and when you're you can't really correct them on you know in the in the tank. Well, you don't understand. Well, okay. If, if they're yeah. if they're not getting it, then you can't correct them. Um that becomes bad TV. Sure. <laughs> very fast. It was great exposure and it had really good validation, but the the problem with it is that most of the products are products that sell online. Yeah. 
and they make a lot of money really, really fast. Okay, from from the exposure, Fran selling franchises is, is a slow process. It takes a lot of time. You yeah. you, you have uh, you have to do you know due diligence, and you know there's a lot more money on the line, and there's uh, there's regulations where you can't sell some things too fast. Like you, there's a there's a 16 day cooling off period when you're buying a franchise where um, mandated by the federal government. So you, you have to let them, you know, you, and, and be honest, if you talk somebody into franchising and, and really break some of the rules, the liability is really high. I mean, the, it's through the roof as far as it could be 10, 20 times what you actually get in that sale the liability if you don't follow the rules. Um, so it's, it's very tricky. So, you know, it, it, it didn't actually help us sell that many franchises. I think it did as far as when it, when you're, uh, just because of validation, but I don't think like right off the bat, it didn't give us a lot of cash. Yeah versus other places where they got a lot of cash you know they they had a lot of cash really fast um but which i think can be a misconception in our industry where people see different like brands go on shark tank and and they hear different different stories and they mix the the like e-commerce brands and mm -hmm. the the explosion effect that they get mm -hmm. from shark tank um, right. and they think, wow, if I can just, if I can get my, my restaurant concept or my food truck or, you know, you name it, um, restaurant industry, um, vendor on shark tank, I will magically blow up. And there, there, it's important to understand how it can impact your business because it also takes a lot of time and preparation and can be a, a large distraction, I imagine, from many of the other things that, that you do and just knowing like the real background of, Hey, how can this impact my business and what should I expect it to do? And lining those two things up is really, really important. And so that's an important story to share. Yeah. And there's, and the, the people don't realize like franchising is, like I said, is a unique business and it, it, people often think, well, you're franchising. You're like this one thing Robert said, he says, well, you're 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 taking money, aren't you, from from people? Isn't that why do you need money? And I go, well, you don't understand the breakdown, I guess, of how the the sales are. You know, you get you spend forty, fifty percent, but sometimes eighty percent of the revenue in commissions when it comes to brokers and lead generation and things like that on a sale like that, and then and you really don't get enough royalty, you know, to really. Uh, it keep on expanding. It might cover your your base cost, but you can't really expand. So you kind of have this front loaded, um, you know, franchising very is very expensive front loaded um, yeah. until you get to a certain mass. And so, but you don't really want to grow too fast because that causes liability. Um, so it's um, that's my opinion. So you want to kind of grow. You know, the, the, you, you kind of be, it's kind of the, I call it the Goldilocks effect. You know, you got, you don't want to be too fast. You don't want it to be too cold. You just want to be just right. And that's difficult to do um, when you're growing with, like the way we've done, we were spending all organic. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, you, so anyway, trying to, trying to get that balance is, is key. And when you're early stage, you know, you, you tend to wear too many hats. And so oftentimes I've learned over the years is that wearing all the different hats can be distracting and not efficient. And so um, I see you've got traction behind you, um, the book. Yeah. So, uh -huh. you know, and I, and I, I like that model, but you've got to get to a certain mass in order to get to really incorporate traction into your, your business model. My, one of my goals is to try and, incorporate that business model into our business yeah fa fantastic yeah we've we've run run our business through like the the eos model and mm -hmm. we 
we love it, but you you do have to have infrastructure in place and, and you got to separate the hats. Yep. I mean, that's the whole idea by the, between the integrator and the innovator is you, you yep. at least have to get to that point where you, you can separate those two hats. Yep. A- absolutely. And so, you know, as you're looking at the business today and, you know, you know, when you have a franchise business, it's not, you were kind of describing the royalties and things there. And one of the crucial components is making sure that, you know, store level uh, sales are successful mm-hmm. and that the store is empowered to, you know, actually bring the revenues that they need to operate as well as, you know, that's how the franchisor continues to, to grow and expand as time goes on as well. Um, what are some of the things at the store level that you've seen your franchisees do that have led to successful store sales from a marketing perspective? Um, number one thing is the stores that do the best are the ones that are in the community the most. So they, where we had some failure in, in particularly one state, it was all one group. It was a learning effect, you know, for us. But they came from either one of two backgrounds. They came in from Subway or, or um, convenience store, um, okay. you know, backgrounds. The problem with that is that a lot of times that is just people happen to, happening on to your, you don't see a convenience store marketing, you know, yeah. except for maybe Maverick, which is massive, right? Something like that. But it's, it's, uh, but you don't see, com- com- it's a convenience, you know, you just happen to be, it's in your path. Yeah. And so, um, but, um, so changing those people's mentalities where they need to get into the store. So I talked to our, our store that did the best over the years. Um, I asked him, I said, what did you do? And I thought it was some of the media that he got a con- attraction from because he had some really viral stuff on on social media and uh, from somebody else. Okay. So it was an influencer. And, um, and so, um, and I, and I expected that to be his number one thing, but it wasn't. He said, I said, what did you do? And I, he says, I consistently had bookmarks in schools. That's it. So just making sure you're in the community, you know, you, you know, we have a bookmark with a reading schedule on the back. That's the number one thing. Now we notice, for instance, in addition to bookmarks, if we just go around our store to the businesses and pass out coupons, that makes a big difference. I, there's a, um, where your office is, <clears throat> I'm surprised because we've done catering up there as because we've done coupons. So we've done catering for businesses and it's, um, as I talked to the, the people that work in the, in that area, I expected them to be more commuters that live further away. But most of the people that work right there, they live pretty dang close. Um, they don't live very far. So they're a prime customer. Yeah. And so being out in the community, sell, you know, passing out a coupon here and there, sampling what we do in Provo is we just stand outside the door with the tank and make ice cream in, at night and sample. And about half of the people that take a sample come in and buy an ice cream. Fascinating. Um, so it's 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 the it's the it's not the flashy, you know, uh, it's the the old school guerrilla marketing. Yeah. And that's the thing. If you have the combination of a good product, especially if there's something unique there, Mm -hmm. um, and you couple that with, you know, like the just being in front of your target, Mm -hmm. those two things, if you do it, apply that consistently, will bring people back to you. And having the good experience is what generates the repeat customer right um, they know i had a good experience if i'm coming back and i have another good experience i now can expect consistency from this brand and i know it's going to be good and i'll bring my friends because i i trust it um 
and then just getting in front of people. That connection, whether it's through the bookmark, whether it's through sampling in front of the store or a movie series at the park or your professor in asking you to write a paper on it, um, mm -hmm. that consistency of being with the community and having a unique and good product will be a winning equation every single time. And so, Jerry, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story, your experiences, you've, you've gone through many different phases of the business through the years and things that, you know, many, many operators have, have dreamed of being able to accomplish. So we really appreciate you coming on and sharing your, got your a story. A lot, lot to learn. And I, and I'm learning that I can't learn at all. Um, but I, I, I'm going to leave one last note. One Please. of, one of the things that I've, found as I've gone through the business, especially with employees, that oftentimes people are afraid to learn and, um, you know, they give them something. Well, I, I had a, I used to work at Novell and I was a tester and I, and, uh, they gave me this, um, product to work on and I was really intimidated because it was a, it was a, a, a network protocol. But it was a specific, and it hadn't even been built yet. So I had all I had was the you know the RFP uh, definition from the standards. Sure, and I'm reading this thing, and it makes no sense. But you got to keep on going. You can't give up. And I and I um, so my point is, don't be afraid to learn something. There's it's so just just don't be afraid to learn something. I love that. That and, is, and don't expect somebody else to do it for you. So I've I've hired people where they said, you know, where they're supposed to have good management experience, but they were supposed to do a certain project. And they go, they come on board and they go, now I got to hire somebody to do the the project. And I go, well, that's what I hired you for. You know, it's yeah. You know, you, you got to don't expect somebody else to do it for you. Certainly, that that is wonderful advice. Jerry, thank you so much for, for sharing. How can the the audience follow you or or Sub Zero and um, you know, keep keep track of you guys? Um, we're on Facebook. I've got a LinkedIn. I'm more active now than I have been in a while. Um, so I've been trying to post. I sometimes uh, get a little self conscious, so sometimes I don't post as much as I like to. Uh, so, but um, or I think I should. Uh, so, and you can contact us through the website, subzeroicecream.com. The full episode is there on the website for, for Shark Tank. So if you'd like to see that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, talk about patents or, or that type of thing, how to get a patent, what it requires, whether I think it's patentable or not, you know, the plus and the cons, you know, the, the uh, it's not all pluses to have a patent um because you have to protect it and um but at any rate but it's um it's certainly an advantage so anyway just those types of things uh so if you if you if anybody wants to reach out um i'm have my contact information on linkedin so my phone number is pretty wide open awesome well jerry thank you for making yourself available and thanks again for coming on the show today thank you Appreciate it. Thanks, Shane. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Restaurant Rocket Fuel. And thank you to the amazing restaurateurs that work so hard to provide an amazing guest experience for our communities. Again, this podcast is sponsored by Boostly. To see how we can drive more revenue to your business, visit Boostly.com. Don't forget to subscribe and go out there and maximize the potential that you and your business have in front of you.